It's my pleasure to be here. Um, I'm an observational cosmologist, so I moonlight in astrobiology for fun. Well, it's all fun, right? Um, and I'm on the IAU uh, working group on education. So this is a good counterpoint to Wolf's talk because I'm going to I'm really focusing, he was talking about future professionals in astrobiology, training of students and moving into the field. I'm talking about the, the flip side of that, which is teaching astrobiology to everyone else, which is to say non-science students, the general public. Um, in some ways it's easier, in some ways that's harder. It's easier because it's an incredible subject, people are naturally interested in it. And it's harder because people uh, are sometimes science skeptical. They don't always have the background for such an interdisciplinary field where they have to understand aspects of many kinds of science, not just one. Um, so I want to give a framework for this. Uh, my context is particular. I'm a Brit, but I've worked in the United States for 30 years. And in the US, we are fighting some serious headwinds and currents of science illiteracy that you well know of. But you shouldn't be too comfortable if you're from another country, because if there were similar polls in your countries, uh, and here there have been on issues of evolution, uh, this was OECD Europe countries, so most South American countries are not in this list. Uh, Chile, I looked it up, is in the middle here, and most South American, Latin American countries are through the middle of part of this list. Um, we would hope that every educated citizen of the world understands the theory of evolution. Um, so this is what you're dealing with. This is a worldwide issue, not an American issue. Um, so I'm obviously going to be a cheerleader booster for the idea of all of you as astrobiologists, as future professionals or current professionals, to take some fraction of your effort uh, from your research time or in addition or outside it to talk to general people. Um, so I'm going to talk about formal and informal learning. Um, the, some of the fun part, if you're not in a university situation where you get to teach, the fun is to get out there, of course. Um, so I give lectures on weird biology or exoplanets or SETI every few months in pizza parlors and pubs and and so on. And, and these are the places any of us, any of you can go, younger the better actually, to connect with younger audiences. So I, I, I always encourage people to do that. But let me start with the traditional classroom setting, which is a room like this. And if you've been to any, if you just hop into a lecture theater in any university in any of your countries, I guarantee the situation has not changed since Greek times. It's people like me it's doing what we've been doing all week, which is lecturing. Um, and in the research in education, it is now demonstrated that this is an ineffectual way to transmit knowledge or to make learning. Um, the attention span of even an engaged, motivated learner drops to 50% after eight minutes of lecturing. Well, most lectures are 50 minutes or an hour or whatever. So you can do the math. This is not actually a very good method. There's also compelling data here. This is from a meta-analysis that included uh, by Scott Freeman, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, it involved hundreds of studies across all science disciplines showing that if you use active learning methods, defined broadly to mean not lecturing, discussions, labs, activities, hands-on, group work, much more engaged learning for the individual student, not transmissive, if you use any set of those techniques, you increase learning in pre and post concept inventories or rigorous ways of measuring learning as opposed to just teaching or contact time. Um, so this has been decided. The research literature is clear. So we should all be using these methods. Now you might say, well, how do you use these methods in a room of this size? I, I teach in rooms this size filled with 150, 200 students. And I'm now in a mode, and many of my colleagues, in a mode where we lecture a third or less than half of the time for sure. Um, you basically break up the students into small groups. You facilitate the work with undergraduate teaching assistants. It's not an expensive model. You don't need a lot of graduate teaching assistants that you have to pay. Um, and you just are creative with using tools and methods that don't involve large amounts of money or expensive equipment to engage learners. Um, you can even do this in a way that you don't actually have to use multiple choice objective testing very much, which is also another method that's proven to be rather low grade as far as encouraging education. Um, 
Uh, an example of this that I've done in astrobiology for a while is a portfolio method where students over a semester, over 15 weeks, build up a, a suite of written material, iterative written material, so they get drafts and comments on their drafts and then they revise them where they involve some of the, I'm not going to go through it in the time I have, but basically they could be responding to articles on discovery of a nearby Earth-like planet. Uh, they can to digest a media report and scrutinize it and analyze it. Uh, they can actually go to the scientific literature, but not the full literature, the semi-technical literature. They can judge uh, websites or competing sources of information and analyze which of them are legitimate and illegitimate, given the fake news and misinformation on the web. This is an extremely valuable literacy skill that all young people need to learn. Um, we have situations where they interview, we have a lot of astrobiologists where I work, so they can interview astrobiologists or talk to working astrobiologists, and then they work with real data sets. This is sort of like citizen science applied in the classroom. Uh, and then they can do a project that's really out of the box, where they can bring the skill that they're interested in, their art skill, their, their um, writing skill, into a project that's a significant part of their grade. Uh, and then in the classroom, we do things that are easy, that don't involve much material. I mean, you can, you can take a material like kiwi or strawberry that just happens to have large cells, and you can crush those cell walls, and you can extract with minimal equipment uh, clumps of nuclear material. And it's an aha moment for students when they actually do that with test tubes in the classroom in small groups. We can cut up pieces of paper and make timeline cards. Uh, for six different eras of the Earth's history, then they have another set of two sets of cards that relate to geology, events un unlabeled with time, but transitions or events that happen in the history of the Earth in geology or in biology, and they have to match the cards with the elements of the timeline. Whoops. And of course, then you get the groups to compare with what each other did, and they don't always agree, so they get to argue, they get to learn about the sort of the combination of astrobiology, the sort of geology and the biology part of the history of life on Earth. Sometimes you take the pseudoscience that's the bane of all our lives and you address it head on. So we have an activity where they're posited with evidence, putative evidence for a UFO, which might be an eyewitness sighting, it might be a photograph, and it might be physical evidence. And they have to debate the, the level of evidence that they would be satisfied with to hypothesize visitation from an alien intelligence. And in the end, you can put all the data together and you find that the students do, after discussion, realize that physical evidence is better than imagery, which is better than eyewitness testimony, which is pretty much the way it shakes down in the field. And so they learn a lot by this. Another example is, uh, you don't have to read all the details of this, there's a great NASA activity that was that's calibrated by astronauts, where you are hypothesized to have crash landed on the moon but survived that crash, and you have to make your way across 200 kilometers of the moon's surface, and you have a set of items that are intact that you have to choose what you want to bring with you, and you have to rank order this list in terms of importance for survival. And so you have, this is a, this is a beautiful activity you can do in an hour with hundreds of students. They work in groups, so first they do it individually. They look at this list and say, what is the order of importance of these things for me to survive on the moon and travel a distance? Um, and then they do their own ranking, and then they get together in a group and talk about it and get a group ranking. And obviously you look for the sum of the ranks, and you compare to the zero order to the experts, which is a set of NASA astronauts that did this. And here's the result of this activity one time, the last time I did it. So the score uh, is a difference in the sum of the ranks relative to the experts. So a set of NASA astronauts is zero on this scale. And the larger the number, the more you're diverging from the way astronauts would rank these items, given all they know. But the take home of, the, obviously a distribution, but the take home of this activity is for students who question group work, which they do in the US where they pay a lot of money for their education, they say, well, you're the professor, you should be professing, you should be teaching, why are you having us work in groups? What's that about? Um, this is beautiful demonstration that group work is good because the groups 
most on average do better than the individuals. The very best individuals do extremely well. But the group think works. It produces a better outcome than individuals just looking at this information on their own. So this is another example. Um, so I've been using active learning methods in the classroom, not just for astrobiology, but for astrobiology it works really well for doing interdisciplinary work. So in the second part, let me talk about the larger reach of informal learning for astrobiology. And I'm talking about a phenomenon called massive open online classes, MOOCs, as you're probably familiar with. Um, they have been around now for seven or eight years, growing rapidly. And these are essentially online classes, not for credit, not for traditional university audiences. MOOC learners are adults, typically. They, always, they usually have a degree already. They're doing it for their own interest. But they're busy people, they have families, they have jobs, and so their level of engagement is different than a student, and their, and their level of motivation, their type of motivation is different, so that has to be recognized. In a sense, they're the purest kind of learner, so they're a really good audience. The reach of the internet and the providers like Coursera get you people in a vast number of countries. And as you probably know, in the developing world, the wireless internet has penetrated places where the wired internet never went, and so you can directly reach into rural, remote communities in developing countries with university-level content and education. This is a fantastic thing in the modern world. Now, I'm, I've had a couple of MOOCs with now actually about 120,000 people enrolled through Coursera and Udemy, and even if I didn't care about them, they weren't getting college credit, I could just say, this is an outreach vehicle, and they've watched over half a million hours of astronomy videos, which is not bad. Um, the worldwide distribution, I think it's had 160 different countries. It's always cool to get an email from someone in Pakistan or in uh, the Horn of Africa who's never encountered the idea of astrobiology or astronomy, and they found the course, and they can do it. They can download it remotely. Um, the completion rate is low. And that's what really distinguishes it from a university course. And you might look at that and say, that's a terrible failure. Only 7% complete the course. Well, a lot of them complete big parts of the course, and that's really not the motivation. So you have to sort of think about these things in a different way. The core of the course is 20, this astronomy course, I'll talk about the astrobiology piece in a minute, is uh, 22 hours of video lectures. And those, I have Spanish translation for all of those, um, because if you look down this list and go further down the list, about 10% of the audience is in Spanish-speaking countries. I have a fully online textbook that I wrote and made freely available online, and Google Translate will turn that into a babel of languages, but not very well. So I use Spanish language students, actual Spanish language speaking students to translate the MOOC itself. So how do you improve that 7%? That's, that's a nice goal to have. 7% of 120,000 people is still a lot of people that finished an astronomy course online. But how do you do better? So using the active learning uh, premise that I just laid out for formal students in a university situation, uh, these may be a little hard to read, these are the predictors of completion. So I can show that uh, the number of people that just register for the class and complete it is this low number, 7%. But the number of people that, who complete the class, if they do the first quiz, is about a third. The number of people that complete the class that do the first writing assignment is even higher, three quarters. And so if you can get their engagement to the level where they actually do some of the written work, uh, and how do you do written work for 100,000 people? Good question. There are, Coursera has peer-reviewed grading mechanisms for very short writing assignments with clear rubrics. And we validated in a research project that the peer assessment is not the blind leading the blind. If you give clear instructions and a rubric and have peer evaluation by four or five different people, it works. It's a valid component of, of assessment. And so you can do written work for huge numbers of people, which makes them feel more engaged, they get to express themselves, and that's part of the evaluation, not just quizzes that are objective. So you try and use active engagement. We use citizen science projects on the side as a significant part of them getting the highest score in the MOOC. This is important. This is the distinction between the learner motivations. So we we did a motivation survey of students in the standard classroom, non-science students at a university, in my big public university, and many of these online, massive open online class students. And so the college students are on the right, 
and the Coursera MOOC students are on the left. And you can see that the highest motivation for the online learners is this pure free choice learning thing where they're intrinsically motivated. They think astronomy is cool. They want to study it. They, in a MOOC, in Coursera, you can take anything you want. If you take an astrobiology or an astronomy class, you obviously have some prior interest. They are also very self-motivated. Self-efficacy is a high motivation for them. And just for learning more about astronomy, you can see just between the second and the third, their grade motivation is low. They're not doing it for a grade. They don't need the affirmation of a grade or an A. They're not doing it for a degree. By contrast, of course, the college students are extremely, as we all know if we've taught them, they're very grade motivated. They may not be, if they're not headed to be scientists, very motivated by your subject, the one that you love and, and are excited by. You can get them excited, but maybe only to a certain level. So when you teach in these different settings, you have to understand the motivations, the context, the constraints, and also the demographics of these students. The typical college student is a you know, young millennial, uh, the typical Coursera student, average age 30 to 35, uh, with a degree, a family, a job, a busy life. So you just look at it in those terms. So I'll finish just by describing an astrobiology branded MOOC that I'm just about finishing up. It'll roll out in January. Uh, because astrobiology is, of course, the in my general astronomy MOOC, astrobiology and cosmology are the two pieces of the course that generate the heaviest discussion. There are discussion boards in Coursera, which uh, go, you know, you can imagine with thousands of people, just monitoring this discussions could take all your time. It's bad enough if you have a class of 100 students answering their email. Now imagine you have 20,000 online learners lighting up the discussion boards. How can you possibly do that? It's down to about an hour a day for me. What happens is Coursera recruits students who took the MOOC and did well in it. They're often amateur astronomers around the world and uses them as moderate, incorporates them as moderators of the discussion boards. So they're your eyes and ears on the ground and they sort of troll around the discussion boards bringing your attention to, you know, a little flaming argument that's erupted here or some misinformation there or some burning questions that are repeated in another thread. And so you have your eyes and ears on the ground. Otherwise, it is pretty unmanageable with these numbers. So astrobiology being the most interesting topic for these learners, I wanted to spin off a shorter course because a MOOC of 22 hours of video lectures is at the very high end. Um, so this is more like six hours of video lecture and is more amenable to the bite-sized learning experience that an adult learner will want in their spare time. And because of the way astrobiology, when it's through a, a standard flow of a, an astronomy textbook, does it in a very traditional way, the history of life on Earth, the idea of life in the solar system uh, situations and life, exoplanets, and then ends up with SETI. It's very standard. It's always done roughly the same way. Well, given the way things are and given the dramatic progress in exoplanets, I just used uh, planets in general as the framing structure for this astrobiology MOOC. So starting from the solar system and then using it to generalize what we know about exoplanets in general, or planets in general. Then going into the methods for hunting for exoplanets, and there are hands-on and citizen science type methods you can employ for both Doppler method and transit method. Um, then getting into the issues more of habitability and biology and the habitable zone. Uh, then moving to the possibility of detecting life on other worlds. And so that starts in the solar system. It t talks about the lessons that can be learned from our planet, of course. Uh, and then into the more speculative realms, the later factors of the Drake equation, if you like, of how microbial life transitions to complexity, intelligence, and potentially technology and ending in a traditional way because it's pretty much always the way it goes with the most speculative part of our large subject which is SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And as uh, to backstop this, uh, there's a final assessment and a project that's a significant part of the completion grade where students are given a set of hypothetical, uh, five hypothetical candidate exoplanets they're given some properties, and they have to infer and interpolate and interpret the properties based on the information they're given and write a report. So they play miniature 
astrobiologist in a significant fraction of the evaluation for this course. The rest of the evaluation is multiple choice quizzes based on the video lectures. And because there's no particular standard textbook for this, I've sort of, dis with the agreement of my publishers, Cambridge University Press, on both of these books, I've stripped away and disembodied and updated the core of a book on astrobiology for a general audience into about a quarter million words and 150 articles. And these are links and hyperlinks throughout the course for people who want more information. So they don't have to go out and buy a book. I also had a set of interviews with astrobiologists that mm, some many of which were not in the published book. 55 or almost 60 of them, and those are available so that people can see what is it like? What is astrobiology like? What does an astrobiologist do? Uh, some people in this room I interviewed some years ago. So these are the assets that sit behind the video lectures and the quizzes, and this is a way of constructing a MOOC. But I encourage any of you who've wondered about the MOOC phenomena, uh, jump in, the water's warm, get your feet wet. Thank you. <laughs>